Welcome to this first in the series of GCSE podcasts, this time on Anglo-Saxon society, which is the period 1060 to 1066 as far as we con- were concerned, but it went back a bit further than that. Society, as I hope you know by this point, is, is how people intera- interact, how the country is set up, how it's organised, and it includes things like the, the social system of what types of people you get, monarchy and central government so who controls the country and how do they do it local government so the different systems that were around the country the legal system uh, the economy and the church that sort of thing these are the things that we're going to look at basically how did people live so without further ado let's get stuck in now the best way to revise from these podcasts is to get yourself a big piece of paper to put the title at the top anglo-saxon society in this case and to record everything that you know about that topic already. So I pause this now and just do that. Then, in a different colour, whilst you're listening to this, you write down other notes. And that will give you a visual representation of the things that are already in your brain and the things that need to go in there. So that's my recommendation to you. And you can repeat that then. You can go away, you can come back, and you can try and record everything you've remembered having listened to this. And then again in a different colour, you write down everything when listening to this that you forgot and it will show you what you've remembered and what you've forgotten and what you need to try revise and remember so that's my recommendation to you good luck with the podcast hope it's useful right starting with the social system at the very top and with all of the power in his hands we've got the king His job was to defend the country from attack, to pass good laws and to make sure the laws were obeyed. He also had some power over the church, though there was often a bit of a dispute over who who had a say in what with the church. During this period, 1060-66, it was kind of set in stone. King Edward the Confessor was in charge of the church. Below the king, you had the earls. There were only ever four really powerful earls, And then there were some smaller earls coming off from that. The four major earldoms, of course, Northumbria in the north, Mercia in the middle, Wessex in the south, and East Anglia, which was a bit smaller, just to the east. The earls, they had to be king's advisers. Um, If they grouped together, they might threaten the king, so the king had to kind of keep his earls happy, but um, they were in control of huge areas of land. They were really, really wealthy. They had a lot of power, and they answered only to the king. Below the earls, another wealthy section of society, were the thanes. Now, the thanes mostly owned land as a result of being given it by the earls, though some thanes owned land because they'd been given it by the king, and they were the king's thanes. The thanes' main role was to collect tax, Uh, to organise repairs of things, but mostly, more than anything else, to be warriors in times of need and to gather the peasants that they controlled to come with them to war. Um, But we've got to remember, the Thanes, the Earls, the King, all together made up much less than 1% of society. There weren't very many of these very powerful, important people. Most people were in the categories that we're coming to now. So you've got churls, slaves and peasants. Of those, the worst to be would be a slave, which was about 10% of the population. They weren't free, they were owned. They were like a a possession, like a shoe, or like a a lawnmower. They did what their master said. The master could decide if they were allowed to marry, what food they would eat, and so on and so forth. The difference between a slave and another person in society is they didn't get paid. They were owned. The best group to be, which also made up 10% of the population in this lower category, were the churls. They sometimes owned their own farmland. Sometimes they worked for for their lord as well, but they could choose which lord they wanted to work for. Um, And they could move around the country. They were absolutely free to do as they wished. In between churls and slaves, who, remember churls, 10% of the population, slaves, 10%, you had the peasants, which is 70% of the population. Now, they got land from their lord, who might be a thane, might be an earl, probably a thane. Um, and, and as a result of the land they'd been given, they had to work for their lord for up to three days a week and do any job that they asked, like taking the animals to market, working on the land. 
On the other days, the other four days, what they could do is work on their own land. Of course, you have to put some time aside for praying and going to church, um, but they could work on their own land the other days. Um, but the other duty of a peasant is they could be asked to go and fight in wartime. So the thane would probably come along and say, right, you, 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 you're coming with me. And that's also true of the churls. The churls and the peasants, they could be called up. And of course, the slaves would do whatever on earth they were told because they are owned. They are a possession. So that's how society is is divided. Most people are churls, slaves or peasants. A few lucky people are thanes and even fewer lucky people are earls. And then there's the king at the top of the pile. So that's Anglo-Saxon social system, how society is organised. Next up, we've got government, a central government, which means the place where the whole country is is controlled. And at the very top, as we said, is the king. Well, the king has got to defend his country and his people from attack. They usually command the army themselves. So they had to have a decent military background. They had to pass laws that people approved of to some extent, but not entirely. They were ones entirely in charge, but they didn't want to annoy the earls. Because if the earls gang, gang together, they could trouble the king. The king also had to defend the church, be very religious and you know, show that in how they were. Um, and they also had to manage the earls and the other nobles, so the thanes as well. So they cooperated with his decisions and helped him to run the country effectively. Other nobles could also mean bishops or archbishops, which are part of the church, of course. The king was the only person with the power to settle disputes between the nobles. And the best kings used a combination of two things to manage their nobles. They rewarded them with land and wealth, and dominated them with their strong personalities. So at the top of the pile is the king, and that's what he did. But sometimes the king needed some advice. And for that, he had a council, which was known as a Witan, um, which is actually short for Witangamot, which is an Anglo-Saxon word meaning meeting of wise men. Remember, the, this game is all about knowing historical terms and having impressive knowledge that might stand out to an examiner. So Witangamot, meaning meeting of wise men, might be a good thing to know. They didn't like meet every Tuesday or anything like that. They meet when the king decided he wanted them to meet so he could get some advice. And the people on the Witan were the most powerful people in the country. So it would include all the earls, some of the most powerful thanes, senior members of the church like archbishops and bishops. But even then, this is just an advisory council. They didn't have power. They could advise and the king could choose not to take that advice. But by asking all of these people these powerful people, the king showed that he respected their views and, and it kept them happy. Now, when the Witan actually had power and significant power at that was if there was a doubt as to who would be the next king because the Witan, they would be the ones who met and made a decision on who would get to be the king. Now, in most circumstances, of course, it would just be the king's son. But as we know from doing the big story, maybe, when Edward the Confessor dies... It's not clear who's going to be the king. So the Witan, they have a very powerful role in 1066 in deciding who that would be. So that's the Witan central government. Central government is, I mean, the word government does not mean politicians. It just means who governs, i.e. who controls the country. And actually, it pretty much boils down to the king. Although he does have to keep his earls and his other nobles reasonably happy. So on to local government and, well, the king, he can't control the entire country on his own. That would be impossible. So the country has to be set up so that things, laws and ta ta laws could be spread and taxes could be collected. So the government, the king was the centre of government in central government, but he had people around the country um, who would look after things for him. So we've already talked about the earls. They'd control the huge earldoms, but they couldn't do that on their own either. Um, so at the very top of local government was the earls, but below them um, you would have other people like the sheriffs, um, who are shire reeves. Um, but the earls, if we go back to them, their job was to ex make sure there was no rebellion, that cr serious crimes, maybe between thanes, would be brought before them and those they would be punished, and maybe most importantly, armies would be raised for the king. 
and this the elves of course were only second in power to the king and as i've said they could rival the king if they banded together but they mostly just worked for the king and did what the king wanted them to do they couldn't collect all the tax themselves, the land was too big, and they couldn't punish every crime in their hands. So they divided their earldoms, the, the kings and the earls, into smaller areas, the shires, which were really big, and the hundreds, which is a smaller area. There were, and A star, well I say A star, people who were level 9, 7, 8, 6, they might know that there were 40 shires. Not everybody would know that, but there were 40 shires uh, in the in the country. And each shire had a thane appointed as a sheriff, which is a shire reeve, that's where the word comes from, sheriff. And the sheriff was sent instructions in documents called writs, which is where writing comes from. So the king has people in wherever the king happens to be, which might be Winchester at the time, it could be London, it could be Canterbury... Um, and the king would send out a writ, which is a, a written document, that's where the word comes from, to the sheriff. Who would receive it from a messenger, open it up and make sure whatever it said in the shire, people would follow those rules. So the sheriff would read the writ, collect taxes and fines that were due to the king, carry out justice, so make sure laws were upheld. Um, and dealt with the most serious crimes like murder, theft and disputes over land ownership. And the sheriff would raise soldiers whenever they were ordered to do so in a writ. Below that, the shires were divided into hundreds. It had nothing to do with the number hundred. It usually had about twelve villages in it. And each hundred had its, had its own reeve. So remember the sheriff comes from the word shire, reeve. Well, each hundred had its own reeve, who held a hundred court each month to deal with the less serious crimes. So if we're talking about crimes, the less serious crimes are dealt with by the reeve in the hundred. The more serious crimes are dealt with by the shire reeve in the shire. Even more serious crimes than that could go before the earls. And the really, really serious crime could go before the king. Because we're coming on to crime and punishment in a moment. Um, so you must remember from this something that confuses people that a sheriff was often a th well was always a thane appointed as a sheriff not every thane was a sheriff but every sheriff was a thane so in terms of local government just to recap we've got the earldoms we've got the shires and then we've got the hundreds and at each level there's somebody in charge in the hundreds it's the reeve in the shire it's the shire reeve or sheriff and in the earldoms, obviously, it's the earl. And in the whole country, it's the king. And that's how government is organised in Anglo-Saxon England. Now, next up, we've got the legal system itself. How did they try to make sure that the law was upheld? Well, the first thing to remember might be Northumbria. Because in Northumbria, the most northern lit, northerly earldom it was quite common for there to be blood feuds and a blood feud is where if somebody is murdered the people from the person from the family of the murdered person might try to take revenge on whoever they suspect did it and then that family might take revenge on them and it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on for generations sometimes and it was just ridiculous and wasteful and expensive and took a lot of time and um, so kings tried to introduce other punishments to try to cut off the blood feuds where they started and one way they did this was the Vergild, spelt w-e-r-g-i-l-d which was a fine which would be paid to any victims of crime or to their families as compensation and the amount of money that was due in a Vergild, well it depend depended on who it was that was killed so, for example, if it was a nobleman, i.e. a thane or an earl or an archbishop or something, that would be 300 shillings, which was a fortune. For a churl, it would be 100 shillings. For a peasant, it would be really quite low. Um, and that, But there were also fines in the Viergeld for injuring people. Um, so if you'd disable the shoulder, 30 shillings. A severed thumb, 20 shillings. A lost big toe, 10 shillings. Now, this, this is probably 
a hefty fine because all these people depended on their thumbs and their toes, toes for balance, thumbs for using tools, and if they couldn't have them, they needed compensating for it. Um, but also it was an attempt, as I say, to, to head off the blood feud. didn't always work because if you offer somebody, you know, I'll give you this money instead, they might go, I'm not interested in the money, I want revenge. My brother or my husband or my son or whatever has been killed and I'm going to get revenge. People don't always listen to reason and, and money in cases like this. Um, so that is the Wehrgeld. There's also then capital punishment and physical punishment. Um, so there was a small number of really serious crimes which carried the death penalty, which is capital punishment. So again, if you're a top student, you might use capital punishment instead of the death penalty. Sounds a bit better. One of those serious crimes was treason. That was the worst possible crime. It was betraying your king or betraying your lord. And the reason this was the most serious crime and always meant death was to put people off from not being loyal. Um, and to encourage people to make sure they were loyal. Also, because the church was so important, anybody ever caught stealing from the church would have a hand cut off. Now, if anybody re-offended after they've stolen from the church, they might even you know, get something else cut off, like another hand, so they've got no hands, or the ear or the nose, or they might have the eyes gouged out. They rarely had prisons, because prison was so expensive. So they tried to make the punishment for a crime so horrific that people wouldn't want to do the crime. Um, so usually prisons were only just used to temporarily hold criminals before they, before they could be put on trial and, and punished. So how did the Anglo-Saxons police all of this? Well, they certainly didn't have a police force. That wasn't created until the Victorian period. So what they did is they put men into something called a tithing. T-I-T-H-I-N-G. And in a tithing would be ten men. And if there was ever a crime that was committed by any one of those ten men, the other members of the tithing, so the other nine, would be expected to bring that person to court. Because if they didn't, and that, that person was caught themselves the whole tithing might face a fine. So this was not, this was collective responsibility. And that's the way they tried to deal with it. Um, another example of collective responsibility for a crime was if a crime was seen to be happening, the person witnessing it had to scream and shout and go mad so that everybody came running. This was called raising the hue and cry. That's H-U-E and cry. If you heard the hue and cry and didn't join in, you could get a really big fine. So whatever you were doing, if you heard the hue and cry, you had to stop and you had to go to wherever that was so that you could help. Now, if somebody happened to be caught, maybe by the rest of the people in their tithing or because of the hue and cry being raised, um, the people would be put on trial. There's two ways you could be put on trial in the Anglo-Saxon period. One... It is a kind of similar way to how we might know now, which is trial by jury, um, which would be in the 100 or the Shire Court, usually. And the jury would be cons would consist of uh, people who knew the accused and the accuser, often people from the tithing, you might expect, of the person who's been accused. If there was no clear evidence either way, then the jury made the decision based on their knowledge of the people concerned. Um, and so the person might never have done it. It's just basically a hunch in some cases. It's not a perfect system by any means. They didn't have fingerprints. They didn't have detectives. They just It was just ordinary people trying to work things out. Anyway, the other way they could be put on trial, maybe if they couldn't decide, would be a trial by ordeal. Because one thing they definitely did at this time is they totally believed in heaven and hell and God. And a trial by ordeal would require you to put your hands in boiling hot water. Now, bear in mind, people were innocent who did this, and they were being tested to see if they were innocent. So you might have committed no crime at all and be put through this. So well, this is just an example, by the way. They might ask you to do other things, um, but often they would harm you and see if the wound was healing. So if they put your hands in boiling hot water, they would lift your hands out, they would wrap them up for a, for a few days or a few weeks, and they'd unwrap them. 
If the hands were healing, then that's God saying this person is innocent. If the hands were looking a bit like they had, they were infected, they were peeling a bit, they didn't look like they were healing properly, then to the people at this time, they thought that was God telling them this person is guilty. So there's trial by jury, which is a bit like how we would do things now, although you know, with none of the technology. And there's trial by ordeal, which is where God would decide, usually based on you hurting somebody. And that is the legal system. And so to the economy. Well, most people, 90% of people, in fact, lived in villages. Very few people lived in towns. And so the major part of Anglo-Saxon economy was an agricultural economy, which means farming. Peasants and churls, who made up most of the population, were mostly farmers. They used their own plots of land to grow crops of things like wheat, barley, vegetables, and to raise animals. Many of them also developed some craft skills and made some goods like pottery or iron weapons and tools, which they might be able to trade or use themselves, but most of the time they just produced enough food and clothing and pots and other goods for their own family. And this is called a subsistence economy. If you're just, just producing enough to get by, that's a subsistence economy. You know, they might get a few bits to exchange and barter, and if if they have a lot, that would be called an exchange economy, but mostly in the village it was a subsistence economy. And if they did have a bit extra, they didn't sell it. They mostly swapped it, because you know, there wasn't a, a massive coin system that we have today, but coins did exist, and coins were worth how much they were because they were made out of silver. So people might swap goods for coins, um, like so you could swap milk in return for pottery, um, but you could also take your milk to the local market and exchange it for money, which you could then use to buy something else, as we know. Um, as I say, the village economy, 90% of the economy was a subsistence economy and an agricultural economy. In the towns, where about 10% of people lived, it was predominantly an exchange economy. The most important day by far was market day and people from villages around may go to market day to sell their things. Towns on the coast or on large rivers, well they were important ports for international trading routes outside of England. So that England would export, which means send things to be sold internationally, things like wool, iron and cheese, and they would import things that they couldn't get in England like wine or some precious metals or spices which you could only grow in foreign countries. Now on market day most things were part, um, well they were exchanged by bartering um, in, a, in an exchange economy. Although some coins were used as well as I've mentioned. So to sum up with the economy, it was mostly an agricultural economy. In towns they had market day. Most of people just got enough to get by. If you had a bit extra you usually exchanged it for things. And that could mean exchanging it for coins, but it might just mean swapping it for other things that you needed. Now last, but by no means least, you've got the church. What you've got to remember about Anglo-Saxon life is that they wholly, 100%, believed in the church and in heaven and hell and God. They thought life was very short and sharp, and they would spend the rest of forever, forever and ever and ever, i.e. they believed they'd still be there now, either having their soul tortured, or they'd be in heaven having a wonderful time. The Anglo-Saxon church, therefore, was very influential, very powerful, and also very rich. And it was there in everyday life, all the time. It was really organised. At the top of the pile, you've got two archbishops who were really powerful. You've got the Archbishop of York in the north. And if you've ever been to York Minster, you'll see how impressive that is. That wasn't around at that time, but you can see how important the church is in York from that building. In the south, you've got the Archbishop of Canterbury. And each archbishop was in charge of the church in their region, north or south. Below them, there were about 15 bishops. So archbishop is at the top, bishop below that. And a bishop would be in charge of an area called a diocese or a see. 
The bishops underneath them had the village priests, and the bishops were the bosses of the village priests. Now, aside from that, and out in the countryside somewhere away from the villages, were usually the monks and the nuns. The monks in the monasteries, the nuns in the nunneries. And in charge of the monastery would be an abbot, and in charge of the nunnery would be an abbess. And the main job of monks and nuns was to pray, but they were also the people who wrote books. And that's important, you see, because most of what we know comes from monks. Most people didn't have the time to write books, and most people couldn't read or write. But monks did have the time, and they were able to. So, And they just have to copy them out by hand. So you may have seen how big the Bible is. They would literally copy the Bible out from hand, so there were other copies. They might also do a bit of farming so they could get by. Um, selling crops that were grown on the monastery farms. Um, and the church was incredibly powerful and incredibly rich. It owned 25% of the land in England. And remember, if we go back to the Witan, its archbishops and bishops were often members of the Witan and therefore acted as royal advisors. So there we go. That's the church. That is Anglo-Saxon society. And if you've listened carefully and made notes, that's what you need to know for probably your first assessment um, and certainly your first assessment if you're listening to this in 2016 having just started the course um, so yeah listen to it make notes make sure you know your stuff as with any history podcast the best way to do this to revise is to maybe get a big piece of paper to write down uh, what you're doing what you're revising so in this case anglo-saxon society and try write everything that you know and know down already in one color in a different colour whilst you're listening, you could write things that you've forgotten, that you missed. And that way you'll have a visual representation of the things you failed to put down. Now I should have said that at the start of the podcast, and I may well say that in the lessons, but it's worth remembering for every podcast after this.